movement. Another is that uh, everybody is related to uh, the various totemic creatures that, that exist within, within their world. Everybody has a totem and that means that everybody at some point in the year has to be in a particular place which is uh, a place of power related to that particular creature. Uh, this is something that might cut across clan affiliation but it means that people have to be in a particular place at a particular time. So that's another uh, source of movement. There's also regular meetings are held within the Coolgan, major meetings of hundreds of clans people. These are held maybe a couple of times a year, uh, but people, if they're going there, will need to be uh, moved from wherever they are. These are generally held in spring and summer uh, because they tend to be held in areas that have uh, sufficient resources to support uh, hundreds of people for uh, maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, um, the second myth is that the, 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 this way of life is, is hand to mouth. Once again, more recent studies have, have shown that in fact they can get everything they need. Uh, on most occasions, there'll be some occasions when they have to work a bit longer, but four to five hours a day. Yes, they go out every day, but they only spend four to five hours doing it. So over a whole week, they'd only worked a 35 hour week. The rest of the time they spend in camp elaborating the things that are of much greater importance to Indigenous people, and that is their own spiritual connection uh, with the world. Just a, a few quotes uh, from a couple from the 19th century, uh, European observers observing what they saw Aboriginal people doing. I think the, the more important uh, quote here is the one at the bottom. Uh, Beth Gott is an ethnobotanist and she has done more to study plant use, plant use in Victoria by Aboriginal people than anybody else. And she says that uh, of this many, 940 plant species, uh, they're using almost a third of them are used for their underground parts. In other words, they're not eating the leaves, the stems, they're eating what's growing underground. And these are the herbaceous species. And that includes, of course, uh, plants that are growing in wetland areas. Uh, if, and that's another reason to look at the landscape that you're dealing with here. And, and within the, the estate of the uh, Warren Jerry Willem in this part of Melbourne, uh, there were a couple of areas that were, that were certainly would be referred to as swamps. Wetlands, we call them now. There's actually no difference between a swamp and a wetland, except how you feel about it. Uh, Wilsmere Lagoon. It was a favourite place for the, the Field Naturalist Club, a favourite fishing place. But it also, of course, would, would have been a ready target for Aboriginal people because that's and women would be waiting around as pictured here. This is not this picture doesn't relate specifically to Wilsmere, but it it is uh, of women waiting in a in a wetland area, uh, and so they would be back in camp early in the afternoon, and the men would similarly be back arriving back early afternoon, uh, and the women would come back with their bags full. Um, well, if you have, as the uh, Warren Jerry Willem do, uh, access to, to rivers, the, you know, the, the northern edge of their, uh, northern boundary of their estate is the Yarra River, so fishing is a, is a possibility, uh, as pictured here by S.T. Gill. But the, uh, I'll put the, I can see I've put the slides slightly out of order, uh, the, the wetland areas are particularly good for plant resources. They are the most biodiverse feature of a landscape, but they also, at the right time of year, have eels. And as, the, as people are moving uh, up the river valley at this time of year, this is when eels are coming down because the eels, fascinating creatures, the eels breed in fresh water 
well, they breed actually in salt water, but they live out their life in fresh. So the eels, eelets have swum up the river, having been spawned in the coral sea, uh, and they live out their life until they mature. And the women, the uh, female eels, um, and then they swim down to mate in, in the coral sea, and that's when they are caught by indigenous people in a variety of ways. This is one way, pictured by George Augustus Robinson in January 1841. And he described it, there's three men wading around in a lagoon. They've got two spears each and they can feel the eel with their feet. They hold it down and spear it. Tricky business, I would think. They spear the eel, pull it out. If it's not dead, they stick it with the other one and then they toss it up on the bank. And they were able to catch, uh, I count, 25 pounds of eels in, in about 20 minutes. So it's a very effective way of doing things. Um, and of course, oh, there's the. And of course, the there's hunting. Men go in the, at the beginning of the day. Uh, the men and and youths would gather, and they would go off hunting somewhere close by. If they have to walk out from camp further than the, than they can walk back. Uh, in a day, then it's time to move the camp. So they go out, they hunt, or not, and come back. Uh, at the same time, the women are uh, somewhere close by, or along the river, in the lagoons, gathering plant foods. Now, I know that uh, there's a bit of use of fire for hunting, but uh, fire was... Um, had a number of uses. It was perhaps the, the major uh, management tool that, that indigenous people had. And this is where, uh, when we look at the areas that are on the vegetation map, that were plains open, plains grassy woodlands. That means that the trees are, well, are reasonably well spaced. This is the area where regularly people would be applying fire. And they did this in a, in a very orderly way in that they did it over a particular time frame, three to five years, uh, determined by uh, how big the tubers were, what they were after were the, the herbaceous species that have tubers. And when the women dig them up, the men, the man who was responsible for saying, okay, we'll burn here now, he's the manager of that area, um, that will be determined on the size. And so if they burn, uh, they will do that on a three to five year basis according to the, the size of the tubers. Uh, and this sort of regular burning, a burning off of everything such that would grow in the otherwise, uh, serves to maintain that open woodland regime that the uh, Europeans found so attractive on the western side of the Melbourne area. Uh, and, but what it did, and this was what was being aimed at, it maximised the growth of the herbaceous species, tubers, such as lilies, organs, and a particular uh, plant called myrnong, or yam daisy. And it promoted species diversity in the grasslands by creating space between the, the tussocks, and that allowed, and because they'd burnt off any prospective uh, shrubs or trees even, uh, that, le that meant that more sunlight fell on the surface of the of the plain of the ground, and that meant the tubers grew to bigger size. And of course, it had impacts on local animal species because animals have preferences in terms of what they want to to eat. Um, now, women. The role of women in this was pivotal. Uh, they would use their digging sticks to dig up the tubers to begin with, but then the far after it was decided firing would take place. Uh, that would happen and the women would come in behind behind the fire having gone through once it cooled down and they would dig up the, spe the tubers then and in the doing of that they would be combine the nutrients of the ashes and the soil around the plants. They'd aerate the soil and they'd thin out those plants that, that they, they have in, uh, in mind to promote which meant of course 
that the next time they came, people came around to that area, the tubers would be that much bigger. And these are the this is a range of some of the sorts of species that all, all of which have tubers. And that that one is Murnong, the Amdasia. It was prolific, grew everywhere, particularly in open woodland areas and out on the grassy plains. Um, and the tubers look like this. So you can see they're, they're quite large in some instances. How are we doing for time? Okay, not him. Now, I think I'll, I'll leave the last word to uh, Deborah Bird Rose, who's an anthropologist. I'd have to say the landscapes of the Port Phillip district that were so attractive to pastoralists, and I've said already, were in large part an artifact of the practices, sustaining practices of the indigenous people. And what uh, Deborah Rose has said is that uh, Aboriginal people had created these nourishing terrains through their knowledge of the country, their fire stick farming, their organisation of sanctuaries, and their rituals of well-being. Thank you.